In the last episode, we had a bloody, brutal fight against Ludwig. And at the start of that fight, do you remember this guy? He was the blood corpse that came towards us in the opening cutscene. Well, on my second fight with Ludwig, on a new character, I discovered that it's possible for this guy to survive the fight. He didn't get hit once, as Ludwig stamped all over the place, across all of my attempts. Just think about how unlikely that is. <laughs> He's probably laughing here like, what the fuck, how did I survive that? On my other characters, this guy's dead, even during the fights with Ludwig that are still ongoing, so I guess you get one chance to save his life. And while I'm busy discovering all these pointless things, you guys are finding some really cool stuff. Commenter Aknaught92 in the last video found something particularly awesome. If you talk to Ludwig's head after the boss fight while wearing the garb of the Healing Church, then he says this. Tell me, good hunter of the church, have you seen the light? Are my church hunters the honorable Spartans? I hoped they would be. Ah, good. That is a relief. To know I did not suffer such denigration for nothing. Thank you kindly. Now I may sleep in peace. Even in this darkest of nights, I see the moonlight. I guess I didn't have the heart to tell him that his church hunters are now blood-raving lunatics. I'll be checking out what happens if you say no here though, it should make for some pretty sad stuff for Prepare to Cry, right? Telling him that his life's work was for nothing. But it turns out, there is one blade of the healing church still alive and human in the nightmare. Shrouded by night, the wits did his try. Colored by blood, but always clear of mind. Proud unto the church. Beasts are a curse, and the curse is a shackle. Only he, the true blade of the church. He's reciting some chant that the healing church hunters must have learned to keep themselves sane while hunting beasts. The repetition would have helped with anyone's sanity. And he's not the only one who does this. The next two characters we meet, in fact, have their own little chants going on. Are you a hunter? Well, that's very odd. You hear the toll of the bell? Liar. Such pettiness will be your undoing. The beast you seek will not be found here. Go back to your hunt. And if you have the chance, put this knight behind you. Places better left untouched. Secrets better left alone. Only a fool would so brazenly wrong. We're going to be hearing that bell before too long. And it turns out it's not a sound you want to hear. At the end of the hallway, we find the Fist of Gratia, which belonged to this hulking brute of a woman who didn't have the dexterity to wield firearms. And up ahead, we run into someone very familiar. This is almost certainly Vicar Amelia, right? It's the same chant we hear before her boss fight, the voice is the same, and it's her white garb, albeit less raggedy, since this is based in the past, I think. We know that blood-crazed hunters ended up in the nightmare, so she must have ended up here when we put her to rest in the waking world. You have to kill Amelia in the waking world before you can even access the DLC, after all. As the eye pendant we found in the last video states, this is the cathedral of the healing church that contains their private research hall. The church and the choir have long experimented on patients in order to gain insight and potentially ascend to the status of great ones. That much at least is clear from the lore we've learned so far. And this research hall can hopefully tell us a bit more about it. Has someone, anyone, seen my eyes? I am afraid I've dropped the milk 
portal. Everything is pale now. Is this Eileen? Listen to the way she says Puddle. Puddle. Sounds like when she says Hunter. Hunter. The accent is the same, for sure, and maybe the voice as well. But beyond that, I guess we need a bit more proof. Anyway, the gameplay in this area is interesting. For me, it was the closest the series has come to having a stealth-based level. I don't know if everyone else experienced this, but I did, because all throughout the level you find these blue elixirs, which is a medicine that was used by the High Ministers of the Healing Church to numb the brains of those they experimented on, and they're certainly appropriate here in this research hall teeming with patients with enlarged heads. Our character retains consciousness when they drink this through sheer force of will, and we make use of the secondary effect of the medicine, which is to go semi-stealthed. And I couldn't always be bothered killing every one of the patients, so often I would use this blue elixir to scout out the level, and I had some pretty cool moments with it. Look at this guy run past. The Souls games are rare examples of games that actually reward you for being observant. Some bookcases, for example, have pressure plates in front of them, which, when pressed, trigger the bookcases to attack you. That's a sentence I never thought I'd say. Also, take for example this huge winding stairway. Some platforms you'll notice are inaccessible, which hints that this staircase will rotate later on and that you'll be rewarded for coming back and exploring again. I just really like stuff that rewards the observant player. And being observant really does reward you, because the item you need here is the Lock Shield, a shield with such low requirements that pretty much any build can be able to use it. It protects you against non-physical damage, and it's going to be really useful in the next boss fight. They've also done a really good job, I think, of not just introducing new enemies, but variations on the same enemy. I can't say the same for games like Destiny that charge you $70 for an expansion with the same enemies and the enemies just have a different skin. No, in this game there's tons of new enemies, and a lot of those enemies, like the enlarged head patients, they all have vastly different movesets, meaning you're always guessing. Moving on a little bit, the main lore question for this area is what was the church hoping to achieve with these patients? So let's listen to some dialogue. Is that you, Lady Maria? No. You're someone else. Please, could you do something for me? I need brain fluid. Murky, mushy brain fluid. You find this brain fluid on fully developed heads, the ones that talk about the sounds that they're hearing. Lady Maria, I'm a Robin. Will I ever curl up and become a man? What say you? Lady Maria. Lady Maria, say something. Anything. Have you heard how curiously the sea churns? Like a storm. But like the rain, only gentle, like dripping water. It bellows from deep inside of me. Here it comes, up through my inside. But gently, like little droplets. The brain fluid reads, extracted from a patient whose head expanded until that was all that they were. These heads and the patients that have them, they're the kind of insight experiments that you would expect from the church. Clearly the things they're saying have some significance. They're all related to water. They're not just the ramblings of insane people. The importance of large bodies of water is actually referenced in a lot of runes. The lake runes, for example, say that they serve as a bulwark guarding sleep and an augur of the eldritch truth. They say that the transcription of the Great Ones in human voices ripples like a watery reflection. They say that we must overcome the hindrances of water and seek what is ours. And in the next video, we'll learn a bit more about what this means, but just know for now that these beings clearly have more insight, even though it's really specific. They're these enlarged heads that hear the water, and so will we, soon.
One patient that hasn't completely turned into a large head talks about being a failure, as if she's let down the Lady Maria, who all the patients clearly see as some caring, motherly figure. One character in particular talks the most. She's called Saint Adeline, and we help her take three helpings of brain fluid. And then... Ah... Ah... I see a shape. My guide, I see your voice, clearly as it bends and bleeds. My own revelation, just for me. <laughs> Thank you for everything, really. I used to be nothing. She's so proud that she became something, like she finally had this purpose. She gives you the milkweed rune if you complete her quest, which turns us into this thing, and she also gives us the balcony key, which leads to the area that used to hold the celestial emissaries in the waking world. It's more proof that these patients were trying to be turned into kin, or these celestial emissaries. The milkweed rune reads, a translation of the inhumane, sticky whispers that reveal the nature of a celestial attendant. Sounds a lot like a celestial emissary. Speaking of failures, this next boss, the living failures. To me, these things, and by extension the other creatures in the research hall, they all seem to be attempts at creating celestials in some form, and maybe even celestial emissaries, beings that can talk or communicate with the Great Ones, perhaps? There are a lot of similarities, especially in regards to where you fight them. It's an interesting boss. Every time you take one out, another one spawns, and there's always going to be four of them attacking you from all sides. They're incredibly slow, but when you deplete their huge health pool, they get bolder and more aggressive and more frantic. At around 50% health, they start casting meteor storms together, which is best defended against using that lock shield that we picked up earlier, as it defends against arcane projectiles. If you're well positioned, you can even get a backstab off while they cast the meteor shower, which I highly recommend because it's a way to get in that much needed damage. After succeeding, we talk to the wandering hunter. We're going to call him Simon for reasons I'll explain later. Oh, hello. Not a pretty sight, is it? The true face of the blood-worshipping, beast-purging, healing church. But that's not all. You seek the secrets held by the nightmare, do you not? Then here's what you must do. Climb the astral clock tower and kill Maria. She hides the real secret. A corpse should be left well alone. Oh, I know very well how the secrets beckon so sweetly. Only an honest death will kill you now. Liberate you from your wild curiosity. Lady Maria. So far, all we know is that she's the caretaker of the patients in the clinic, and that she hides the true secret. I am confident in saying that this was my favourite fight in Bloodborne so far. I love Hunter boss fights in this game because they put you on what seems like even footing with an opponent and it allows you to make good use of the health regain mechanic, unlike most beast enemies that just flatten you in one or two hits. I hate that. I love when it's a fight where you can regain your health. 
You can probably parry her, but I wasn't gonna find out. I feel like spamming parry is a really shitty way to do this fight. I wanted to dash around and use my reflexes and my blades of mercy, and I just wanted to get through all of her phases that way. And as we're discovering every boss in the old Hunters has phases, Maria is no different. She has three. Every time I fought her, I fought one stage further. I did this because her phases are actually pretty well designed. It's not like fighting Ludwig, where you fight a completely different version of him at 50% of his health. No, Maria trains you in her attacks. Every phase simply upgrades the attacks that she's already been using, meaning that earlier phases train you for future phases, and they reward you for learning. Such a good fight. And I'll tell you now, Maria is going to make a fantastic Prepare to Cry story. There is so much interesting stuff to talk about, but we'll have to do it another time. Let's talk a little bit about it. So, as her set says, she's an apprentice to German, someone who looked up to him, though he had an affection for her that she didn't seem to sense. Since German modelled the hunter's dream, it's clear that the doll is actually modelled after Maria, this caretaker who shares most of her physical attributes. Uh, Maria is a caretaker of the patients, and the doll is a caretaker of us. There's a lot of similarities there, not just appearance. However, German certainly seems displeased with the doll in the dream. And for a man who has supposedly created the doll out of love for another woman, he never interacts with her. Perhaps it's because the doll has a completely different personality? Maybe it's because she's far less headstrong and way more subservient. He couldn't replicate who Maria was in the dream. But yeah, lots to talk about. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you for watching, and it's time to get into some secrets.